Well, welcome back to Pastor Talks. Um, we took a week off because me and my wife were on vacation um, and we're back here. And so if you've been with us, then we've been walking through the book of First Peter and we're on First Peter chapter 3 today. And so um, we do this for the purposes of encouraging you in your walk and encouraging you to encourage others. That the, the Word does that. When we get in the Word and we study the Word, it fills us up so that we can fill others with the same goodness that God gives us. And so I hope that that does that for you this morning. And without taking up any more time, I'm going to dive right into 1 Peter chapter 3. It reads this. It says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without the word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, braiding of hair, putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit for which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You are her children. And if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening, likewise, Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. <clears throat> it's interesting here. He, he talks about this relationship between husbands and wives, and as he does, he's pointing them to the deeper purpose of this marriage union between man and woman where there are wives that know the Lord, that are married to husbands that do not know the Lord, and that in the way that they conduct themselves, they're led closer to him. And the same truth applies to wives that are married to husbands that know the Lord, where um, a relationship between a husband and a wife can be one that hones a relationship with the Lord. I had a mentor one time say that a wife is a spiritual sharpening tool. And then he speaks to husbands in the way that they should then honor their wives, seeing them as delicate, beautiful things and treating them as something that's meant to be protected. And then another place in scripture, it says that husbands should love their wives in the way that Jesus loved the church, willing to lay all of yourself down so that your wife can have something that she might not have even deserved, but that you wanted for her. I'm going to keep reading here in verse 8. It says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or rivaling for rivaling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lip from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, he gives them this blessing that talks about not paying evil for evil and not matching rivalry for rivalry. And... What I want you to see is that we're about to step into a very tense political season as a nation. And there's a tendency for us to want to fire a cannonball at someone who shoots a BB at us. And the Lord is calling each of us, no matter who we are, no matter what we believe, no matter what we've experienced, to pay good always back, even for evil. And that our main focus in life and that the one thing that we are called to see above all else is to be a blessing to the world that we may be a blessing in the way that we have been blessed by God that's what he says unity of mind in one thing to be a blessing to be someone or a group of people that are known for being blessed and having blessed others go ahead and keep reading with me in verse 13 now 
Who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered by those who rival your good behavior in Christ, they may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if one should be should be God's will than for doing evil. So now he's talking about this continuing of being a blessing. There is no harm in being passionate about something that is good. And in fact, as you do that, people are going to wonder where you find your hope, what it is that that has happened to you that makes you so positive it makes you so uplifting and that each one of these things is pointing people to blessing and in and of itself is a blessing and so don't worry about what someone might say to you or if people might slander you for speaking a certain way but as you defend the way that you live and the thoughts that you have about the Lord, do it in a way that is gracious, he says. Do it in a way that points them to who God is. Peace, life, goodness, grace, all of these words describe our Lord and all of this is what it means to be a blessing to the world, to be an encouragement to the world. We open this and we listen to this so that we will then be a blessing and an encouragement. Go ahead and keep reading with me. Verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for the good conscience through the resurrection of Christ Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with the angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Christ is always the example. And Christ chose to suffer so that he could walk in peace, so that he could point people to the Father. Christ chose to die to himself so that others could have something that they didn't deserve. In the same way that husbands and wives sacrificially love one another and point one another to this relationship with God, we are called to do this same exact thing for the people in our lives. And he gives this imagery of the way that God has shown his faithfulness all the way back to this, this flooding of the earth and that only eight people were saved and they were saved through this water, through the passing of the waters and this new life comes out of that moment. And the same is true for this baptism in the Lord, that when we're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, we are then anointed and covered in generations of promises that come from our Heavenly Father. Promises that can't be taken away, promises that can't be shaken. They give us an eternal hope, an eternal peace, an eternal life, all of which is for the purposes of then sharing that with other people. That as we step out of the waves of this ocean of discouragement and chaos, and as we step into the unknown foggy storm that is the political season in the United States, the church stands as a lighthouse, beaconing people towards hope. And so that is, that is my challenge to you this week. And I don't know what that means. It, it might mean sharing this video with someone. It might mean having a conversation about someone's lack of a relationship with God and how that might improve their life graciously. Remember, I don't know what this challenge means for you, but we are called to be something that is set apart, called to be something that is holy, 
so that other people can have something that they didn't earn, they don't deserve, but they, they need and that their Heavenly Father wants for them. So I'm going to pray for you and for your day and for whatever conversation the Lord has called you to. And I hope that the rest of your day is blessed. Heavenly Father, we so desperately need your guidance and we need your wisdom and we need the peace that can only come from you. Father, help us to reflect the love that you have for us to those that are in our lives. Father, help us to be the people that you've called us to be so that we can give to those that do not that which they so desperately need. You're so good to us, even when we don't see it, Father. Help us to be the children, the neighbors, the family members, the co-workers that you would be to all the people in our life, for your kingdom, for your glory. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.